Dear champions, the objective of decarbonizing societies in an economically sustainable way requires a strong push to accelerate clean energy innovation. New processes and products in the clean energy sector can reduce the costs of decarbonization and at the same time increase economic productivity and employment. Through research, development and innovation, new and more efficient solutions are created to manufacture existing clean energy technologies or to develop new technologies. By accelerating the development of new, transformative, clean energy technologies, society can not only mitigate against climate change, but can also accelerate economic recovery and build up resilience. This can only work if the immense potential that individual innovators hold to bring new solutions to the market is adequately mobilized. The ingenuity, motivation and entrepreneurial spirit of these innovators is a truly valuable asset for society. It is in this spirit that the Champions Programme was launched by Mission Innovation and supported by the European Commission. The specific aim was to activate a new generation of innovators working on clean energy technologies. These innovators, you, are the real engines of transformative change in the energy sector. And our role is to remove all barriers and gaps for your potential to be fully tapped. Now, the Mission Innovation Champions Programme has reached the end of its first phase. This programme was a success. The new phase of Mission Innovation should further leverage the potential of individual innovators to create appetite for innovation across all sectors of society. Because clean energy innovation will not accelerate if we do not build on all talents whichever the age, gender and social origin. I wish you the best of luck in helping to pilot the next phase of this exciting initiative for which you have my continued full support. Hello everyone, my name is Patrick Child. I'm Deputy Director General uh, for Research and Innovation in the European Commission um, and Chair of the Mission Innovation Steering Committee. And I'm very happy to have the opportunity to be the moderator of this important Mission Innovation Ministerial side event devoted to the theme of back to the future innovation of innovators, bridging the gap between ideas, uh, innovations, markets to accelerate clean energy innovation. And with this event, we're excited to celebrate the conclusion of the first edition of the Mission Innovation Champions Programme. This programme has been highly successful um, pillar of our first phase of Mission Innovation. And over the last three years, 40 outstanding innovators have been profiled globally for their active role in accelerating the clean energy transition. So we very much hope that the international recognition and visibility that we've provided to these innovators by the Champions Award has helped them to further boost their roles as innovation leaders. And today we want to step up the public dialogue we started with the Champions at the fifth Mission Innovation Ministerial event in Riyadh last September. And so the objective of today's roundtable is to discuss with the Champions and young innovators how we as policymakers can best develop them to leverage their potential to bring to full speed the clean energy transition. And so the ambitious decarbonisation commitments that Mission Innovation members have put forward can only be met with the sort of extraordinary collective efforts uh, that we're seeing to accelerate clean energy innovation. Um, and innovators have to be the real engines of our clean energy transition. And our role as Mission Innovation member governments is to support them in the best way forward. And therefore, I'd like now to uh, kick off uh, our proceedings uh, with a, a, a keynote introduction from uh, our hosts uh, for the Mission Innovation um, meeting uh, from the uh, Energy Ministry in Chile. Uh, Gabriel Prudencio Flano is head of the Renewable Energies Division at the Ch Chilean Ministry of Energy. Before joining the ministry, he was operations manager of Valhalla, a company that develops pump storage and photovoltaic plants in northern Chile. So he has an excellent perspective, I think, uh, to bring together this uh, uh, dynamic of what innovation can bring and the partnership that we need uh, with um, our innovators community. So, um, Gabriel, over to you, please. Thank you, Patrick, and uh, thank you to all the or organizers for putting uh, this uh, event together. 
uh, on a more broader basis, also welcome to everybody to this uh, 2021 SEM uh, MI gathering, which for the second time will take place in this uh, online format, uh, which may have some downsides, but also I think we also have appreciated during this last uh, time uh, all the upsides that we see from here and uh, allows us definitely to uh, put these uh, events together with more people and to have also more people that can see and can be part of this in, in, in some part. There will be more than 50 events available um, or are happening during this week, more than 50 events that all of them will be available through our platform, uh, the, the, uh, which also we are uh, invite all of you to visit them and to and to explore their, um, of course, the events, but also the networking opportunities and the opportunities to meet other people as well. Uh, SEMMI this year is based on four main focuses, uh, four main keywords, I would say. Uh, one of them is collaboration, uh, and it has to do, we have been collaborating a lot during the last uh, time, of course, in the last decades, uh, but how we can collaborate effectively, something that we also want to highlight and we want to work, we want to explore as well. Uh, secondly, um, how we address social gaps. Uh, we know that there are gender gaps, there are gaps in, in technologies, there are gaps in labor skills, uh, different uh, type of gaps around the world that we have to address so that we don't leave anybody behind in this uh, challenge of uh, addressing carbon neutrality and, um, and uh, the energy transition. Uh, new actors would be an important pillar as well, how we can include uh, new actors, huge challenges will require uh, new actors as well. And as a fourth main pillar, uh, we highlight the importance of action uh, our slogan in the last COP was time for action, and we want to inherit that for SEMMI as well, and how from all of these we can uh, create specific actions that will address or allow us to address uh, the different uh, challenges that, that, we, that we face. And how we can bridge gaps between ideas, innovation, and markets to accelerate the clean energy innovations uh, will require uh, a lot of uh, collaboration, uh, uh, addressing social gaps, new actors, and of course, a lot of act uh, action. So all of that, uh, I think, is in, in line with what we're doing. What are the challenges that we're facing, not only in Chile, but around the world? Uh, one of them is, of course, uh, climate change that we know and science has been clear uh, that is already affecting and will affect in the future even more, especially to the most vulnerable in this world. So I think we have, uh, for any point of view that you look at it, an and important um, uh, challenge to address that, not only for environmental point of view, but also for from a point of view of the economics and the show, social impacts that that may have. Uh, Chile already committed. Chile was actually the first developed countries to to commit to be carbon neutral by 2050, by mid the century. And Chile has based its um, its commitment uh, through. It's not only a commitment, it's actually an, a plan that we have put in place to address this, and it's based on four main pillars. Um, one of them is to, and all of them have uh, important uh, challenges, both in innovation uh, and also, of course, rely on existing uh, technologies as well. Uh, one pillar has to do with uh, retiring our core coal power plants and the existing fleet, which already produce or produces about 40% of our electricity generation, and how we combine that with the acceleration of uh, renewables that we have seen in Chile in the last years. E-mobility will have an important role as well. Second point. Energy efficiency, we expect actually the most uh, energy or the carbon reductions from energy efficiency. And hydrogen is something that we see as well, that will have an important role as well. And of course, opportunities uh, in innovation uh, in all of those topics are important. Of course, as said before, we rely, of, of course, in, in, in existing technologies as well. But what we will do with all the solar or how we will recycle all the solar panels and batteries that we're installing today, uh, how we will lower the implementation cost of winds and how we will allow the wind technologies to work in extreme conditions, uh, how we will enhance smart grids so that that allows technologies uh, uh, access for everybody, uh, how we will work innovative solutions for heating and cooling, for example, in buildings that we know that will be um, have grower demands in, in developing countries. In, in hydrogen, of course, uh, as well, there are important challenges as well uh, in transport, in compressors, in technologies, in how we will lower cost and, and all of that. Chile, uh, I will not get into details here about what we have done in, in innovation and research. We have put in place, uh, um, uh, perhaps to highlight one topic, uh, a clean technology institute that will have uh, uh, fundings for $50 million a year. Uh, 10 million euro dollars a year for the next 10 years and another fund for hydrogen for 50 million dollars. Uh, so it's some of the topics that we're doing. We 
uh, may not be high in the rankings of the world, but we have uh, ranked uh, number one in the last uh, Global Innovation Index uh, from 2020. Uh, and what we do know is the importance of uh, understanding uh, the strengths and the weaknesses uh, that we may have, and that we are sure will provide the basis uh, to um, to a collaborative uh, work. Uh, and from there, uh, we also want to highlight this importance of this event that will uh, give us the place to discuss all of this and that will uh, allow us to uh, work in a collaborative way to address uh, social gaps, to include uh, also new actors and to have a lot of uh, time for action as well. Thank you very much. Gabrielle, thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, congratulations to Chile and to our Chilean hosts, uh, not only for your amazing progress domestically, but for hosting such a magnificent series of meetings this week. And we're really uh, grateful for all the work that you and your team have put in. Um, and I'd like to come to another long-standing friend of uh, Mission Innovation, uh, Paul Durant, who is head of the End Use Sectors and Bioenergy um, uh, Department of the uh, International Renewable Energy Agency, uh, and a former head of the Mission Innovation Secretariat. Um, uh, and I think Paul is uh, uh, looking forward to sharing some of his experiences with this uh, vital question uh, of how we can bring innovators uh, to exploit their full potential uh, in support of the clean energy transition. Uh, Paul, over to you, please. Great. Thank you, Patrick. Great to be here. I was asked to share some perspectives from Irina on the barriers hindering the transition of innovations from deployment, uh, from, from development to deployment, and on strategies that support that transition. Now, stating the blindingly obvious, innovation is a complex process, and I think clean energy innovation even more so. So with the following, I'm not really afraid offering solutions, but I'm just offering some perceptions that maybe spark debate. I really welcome pushback on anything that follows, particularly from our mission innovation champions who are living and breathing innovation, not just observing it as I do. I'm focusing here on public sector support, but it, of course it's critical that's closely linked to the private sector. I think it's worth saying up front that the landscape of public sector support for clean energy innovation in many countries has strengthened greatly in the last decade or so. We've collectively learned a lot from our past successes and our failures. But this next phase of the energy transition poses, poses new challenges. So the first point I want to make is that the policy context has changed in many countries. The new deep decarbonization and net zero emission goals that many countries have set and the rapid transition needed to get there really are game changers. And I'm not sure that all decision makers have yet to fully internalize what that net zero goal really means. It means, amongst other things, that we do need to be consistent with in our focus on that and everything we do moving us towards that goal. And it rules out solutions that merely partially reduce emissions unless they're stepping stones towards deeper cuts. It also means we have almost no time left. The pace and scale is daunting. We need a tenfold increase in renewable deployment, a fivefold increase in hydrogen production, a threefold increase in sustainable biomass supply. And that means we can't afford to let innovation gradually emerge. We need to force the pace. We need to find solutions. And we need to not go down too many blind alleys. So let's talk a little bit about barriers. I'm not going to list some of the usual suspects, which we all know about, regulatory frameworks, financial instruments. So they're certainly very valid and real issues. But let me focus instead on some misconceptions and confusions. There may be barriers to smart action by decision makers. I picked four, I could have added more, and they're not universally true, but they certainly occur more often than is desirable. First up, we get the impression that senior decision makers in the wider community often see innovation differently to those of us who are closely involved in the process. We need to improve their understanding and manage expectations. Innovation and invention are not synonyms. Um, the perception from some that innovation is mainly about breakthrough inventions, dreaming up something completely new and exciting. In the energy sector, at least, the majority of innovation comes through a long, hard slog of gradual, iterative improvements with the occasional jump forward. And that's important because given the 2050 timeline, most of what we will use at scale in 2050 will already have been invented now, in the sense that someone's thought of it and tried it in some way. 
it may be too expensive or too fiddly or unreliable, but it's there to some degree. IRENA's 1.5 degree scenario is built on that premise to show how we can reach net zero with the building blocks we have today. It's the pace of deployment that's lacking. Point two, the value of DEF is a term we use a lot. I'm not sure it's that helpful a term. It implies there's one thing to fix. In practice, there is not just one value of DEF. There are multiple and they vary in nature and in the context. So support really needs to be tailored, flexible, staged, consistent, and predictable to bridge those multiple valleys. Point three, some of us are still thinking too linearly, linearly about innovation. And the terminology we use doesn't help. The term RD and D and the TRL concept implies this sort of steady progression and innovation is certainly a journey but it's one with many false turns and occasionally circling back on oneself. We need to ensure that the support recognizes that and persists throughout. And we too often think about technology innovation in isolation. It's systemic innovation that delivers solutions that actually get deployed. And that means from early on, thinking about how the technology can work with new ways of operating systems, with innovative business models, and be enabled by innovations in finance and policy. In our arena, we've done a lot of work on this. Our innovation landscape for renewable powered future projects showcased successes and provides a toolbox for creating solutions that when combined, address those different innovation dimensions and are, have real world impact. Our next phase of work is focused on a similar systemic perspective for electrification of end use sectors. So those are some of the problems. What strategies have we seen that might work? I want to highlight six points. Building a shared understanding of what's needed is an important starting point. What are the end goals? Where are the innovation gaps? And then communicating that clearly. Getting as many people as possible on the same page helps in collaborating and deconflicting and inspires new thinking. It requires a lot of discussion and debate across key stakeholders but it's certainly not one buddy dreaming it up in isolation. We need to reach beyond technology innovation to deliver those systemic innovation solutions. And innovators may need to be proactive and innovative beyond their technology, pairing it with a new business model or saying to policymakers, what my technology really needs to have impact is X. We need to blur the line between commercial and pre-commercial. In regulated market, what's really commercial at the end of the day? One approach works very effectively in many contexts this is linking innovation to public or indeed front running companies' procurement strategies. Lots of companies and governments want to be seen to be green and may pay a premium for it. Provide a portfolio of support mechanisms that fit the different needs and evolve over time. Forward planning, visible to innovators and investors is necessary so they know that when they get to that next milestone, there will at least be opportunities to bid for funding for that next step. Building public and private consortia around specific shared challenges can really have impact. It's easier in the early stages of innovation, but it does also work well on shared topics where participants don't see themselves losing competitive advantage. And finally, we can use international cooperation to create breadth and scale of innovation effort. I said earlier, we need to let many flowers bloom, but we don't always need to joint fund things or share commercially sensitive information. If country X is funding A and B, then if they know that country Y might choose to fund B, C and D. And the dialogue between countries can really enable that. Well, I think that's pretty much my time up. You may not agree with all of the above. I think there were many other things that I could have highlighted, but I hope it's helpful in sparking some thoughts and stimulating debate. Many thanks for your attention. Um, extremely, uh, Paul, thank you very much. Uh, very, very thought provoking, and I think sets the scene very well uh, for the rest of our discussion. So for this round table, we're going to um, have uh, interventions firstly from five of our mission innovation champions from around the world. Uh, we'll then hear from 
one industry uh, representative um, and then one young innovator engaged in promoting clean energy innovation. I think we all recognize that in a fast changing world, innovators need to re re rapidly adapt to a changing context and preserve their unique vantage point from which they can gain valuable insights. And so our aim with this uh, round table is to hear uh, from these innovators to share their first hand experiences in advancing innovation from the development and demonstration stages into commercial maturity and in pro promoting more generally uh, clean energy innovation. And I think that these stories from our innovators are going to be a valuable source of inspiration uh, for us uh, policymakers. And I think that this sort of symbiotic relationship between uh, the innovative community on the one hand um, and, and the policymakers and, and the government's representative mission innovation uh, will help us to identify the sort of barriers that exist and what policy instruments can work in order to help overcome those barriers. So without further ado, I'd like to move on to uh, introduce our panelists and I'm going to introduce them individually and then I'm going to ask one, um, one question from each. And I'm going to start with um, Jafar Benabou. Um, he is Hello. <coughs> manager and co-founder of Solar E-Cycles uh, and Morocco's yeah. Machine Innovation Champion for 2020. And uh, Jafar, I mean, we're very happy to have you with us. Um, and of course, you're Thank deeply you. committed to making clean mobility a possibility for Africa um, in an affordable way through innovative solar electric tricycles. And so I'd like to ask you uh, well, a few questions flowing from that, if I may. I mean, firstly, what do you think is needed to speed up the adoption of these innovative technologies in Africa? Is it just a question of financial incentives, uh, information and infrastructure, or is there something missing, some other ingredient that you point to? And most importantly, how can you think governments can help you in removing the sort of barriers that you face as an innovator and an entrepreneur in developing and, and rolling out uh, these very innovative um, a clean energy product. So, Jafar, you're very welcome. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving the word. Well, I think that the most important thing to speed up uh, of, uh, of innovative technology and mobility, particularly, is to uh, is to prepare first um, at first a global standard and laws concerning the use and the marketing of this innovative technology. So, just coordination and partnership between private and public sectors with the purpose to structure the market for electric mobility and uh, keep trust of users uh, toward this, uh, this technology, this new technology, and even more uh, make it stronger. So, as you know, uh, more has seen a rapid uh, boost in ICE uh, during the last years, as far as the rest of uh, Africa, uh, African country. So, immunity is for us the opportunity to inverse the trend, and this is the best time, the best moment to do it from a long time perspective. The second question I think that uh, removing custom bar barriers in uh, some African countries would be a good start, uh, making access more easy for people suffering uh, from lack of mobility or user. Shift in EV alternative is necessary. Also, there is a need to develop recharging infrastructure, um, support and installing bonus taxes for responsible and durable technology would be encouraging. In order uh, to make it possible, we need uh, an important um, uh, uh, partnership and the proximity between uh, private and public sectors. So, for the last question, we are currently in Morocco working with governments and the public sectors. Public organization involving in um, in uh, standards and law in the electric mobility area in order to secure the market and make it more structured um, in order uh, to um, to make more easily more more easy to, uh, to to sell and to market those kind of technology and those innovations. Thank you. Jafar, thank you, thank you very much indeed, and congratulations again on on the success of your of your work and your and your products. Um, and I'm sure thank that you your message much. on the need for partnership between uh, the policymakers and uh, government and um, uh, successful industry, and, and on the basis of trust, is is a very important message for us. Um, exactly. Our next thank speaker. You very much. No, no, thank you. Eh? And our next speaker today uh, is uh, Panima. Uh, Jalil Hal, uh, a senior scientist who heads the Energy and Freshwater Group uh, at the Indian uh, National Institute of Ocean Ocean Technology, uh, and uh, Panima is the 2020 Mission Innovation Champion 
for India, and we congratulate you on your success in that uh, important role. Um, and Panimina, I'd like to ask you from your experiences in successfully demonstrating ocean energy technologies, what can you tell us about the challenges that you've encountered in your efforts to scale up and reduce costs of ocean energy technologies? And what do you think your government should do in order further to promote ocean energy innovation uh, in India? Uh, hello, and thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity to share my thoughts. Uh, so yes, uh, clean energy is uh, or has assumed a lot of importance today uh, in India. Uh, of course, the focus has been solar and uh, wind. Uh, there are uh, targets that have been set up for the next few years. Uh, but I'm handling ocean energy, and uh, ocean energy is still in infancy in India. Uh, we have developed small off-grid devices for harnessing power from waves and marine currents, especially tidal streams. Now, uh, these are just small off-grid demonstration kind of devices. And uh, uh, to answer your question, uh, I'm facing a lot of challenge for the scaling up uh, uh, of these devices. Uh, the first uh, uh, problem that we, we face here is uh, the lack of confidence or the perceived risks because it's an ocean technology. As you all know, there are a lot of environmental conditions to deal with in the ocean. And so there's always a fear that ocean energy devices may not really withstand for a long time. The next issue is that uh, because solar has become so popular, there's a tendency to sort of compare the costs of solar with any new renewable, renewable like ocean energy. And uh, we all know that even solar has taken decades to come to this level and this cost. And uh, therefore, it's a bit unfair to you know have to compare it with solar right at the beginning stages. What we need to do is develop large prototypes and demonstration de of devices offshore so that we can come to know the real viability. Of course, the Indian government is funding an ocean thermal energy conversion project to power desalination in an island in Lakshadweep in the Arabian Sea. And uh, this is like under 100 kilowatts, but it's a large enough project which will be uh, enabling us to scale up for much higher uh, ratings. Um, the other issue in India is that uh, the offshore infrastructure is not very good. And so uh, everything is capital intensive. Deployments, installations all become very, very expensive. And hence, it's a vicious circle wherein funding becomes more and more difficult. Um, th there is a need today for the Indian government to fund large prototype demonstrations offshore and also a megawatt range offshore platform mounted ocean thermal energy conversion or OTEC plant, uh, which will enable us to understand the technical as well as the commercial viability. Even the demonstration projects like this can lead to job creation and capacity building for offshore uh, installations and deployments. Uh, uh, the, lastly, I would like to say that the Indian government has taken a step forward. Uh, they have declared ocean energy as a renewable now so developers can uh, you know uh, take the renewable purchase obligations just like solar and wind uh, we are moving in the right uh, step ahead and i'm sure we will see more uh, government intervention in the near future thank you very much for this opportunity well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much indeed, uh, Panima, and uh, thanks for sharing with us your story. And uh, and I think that uh, you you capture very well uh, the sort of uh, challenge of uh, overcoming the valley of death, which uh, Paul Durant mentioned in his remarks a, a few moments ago, but also highlighting the importance of government and public support for scaling up um, uh, the promising new technologies, which are, of course, uh, uh, need to, to be de-risked and, and demonstrate their potential alongside um, existing uh, clean technologies. So a really uh, rich and, and interesting experience. So, so thank you. Thank you very much for that. And, and thank you for joining us again today. Yeah? So I move next uh, to, to our next uh, uh, successful innovator, which is uh, Michaela Kendall. Uh, who is the CEO of Adelan, uh, one of the world's first fuel, fuel cell businesses. Um, uh, Michaela has managed industrial R&D programs funded by various governments, uh, but uh, was uh, successfully awarded in 2020 the uh, Mission Innovation Championship for 
the United Kingdom. And so congratulations on that success. And Michaela, you've been working, I think, internationally with a range of different governments, businesses and institutes over your uh, very distinguished uh, career. Um, and I would like, I think, to hear from you your experience on what has held back the scaling up of innovations and how can we accelerate uh, scaling up and deployment of new technologies that have been successfully demonstrated, uh, in particular uh, using the sort of international cooperation mechanisms that we have, like mission innovation in the clean energy space. So, Michaela, please. Thank you so much. And firstly, I'm very grateful for the opportunity uh, to have my voice heard today. So thank you so much um, and the kind introduction also. I'm conscious that um, actually many women that I started on this tech journey with um, 30 years ago are no longer in hydrogen tech. So I feel a responsibility today to represent them and, and, and also the younger generations of women who would be, like to be part of this huge technical opportunity. So my comments today are in part on behalf of those women without a voice. And I want to be honest about my experience and tell you the difference that using a single policy could make. So my career to, uh, to date has been tough and most of the challenges I've chosen. So I've moved between technologies and disciplines, institutions and countries, and it's given me a really unique international view of public and private tech programs and also behaviors, human behaviors. Um, I've massively enjoyed the international aspects of collegiate and competitive science. Um, I've enjoyed the teamwork, the shared life experiences, and of course, the dinners and the social aspects. And I've been really encouraged by senior scientists to uh, pursue my own tech and, and scientific agenda. But in all of the countries that I've worked in, I have met with sexist attitudes and behaviors. And I believe, honestly, that this has slowed progress for me and for other women. And ultimately that slowed innovation and technical uptake and decarbonization. So, I, I can't really believe it's still an issue in 2021. And, um, you know, you can think back to Marie Curie, who also experienced it 100 years ago, that we really need to address this. And I think one single option um, is available to us to do so. So today I'd like to call a, a time for action on the lack of funding going to women in science and business. Removing these economic barriers to women will remove some of the sexism that is sadly alive and well in some universities and governments around the world. So when I set up the, or helped to set up the UN Hydrogen Centre in Istanbul and the EU Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Joint Undertaking in Brussels, which is a 2 billion euro programme, um, I didn't expect that almost all of the money would go to male scientists. Um, I, I wasn't even really aware that that was happening until I started to question why I couldn't get independently funded, and um, even by the bodies that I helped to create. So when I asked the UK government for the stats on female funding, for example, when I was rejected from um, the Engineering and Physical Science Research Council, they actually didn't want to tell me about the, they didn't want to be transparent. So I had to make them tell me. Um, and it turned out that only 6.7% of funding the year that I applied went to women um, from the Engineering and Physical Science Research Council. And I really immediately understood why I've never really been funded as a principal investigator by my own government. Very few women have. So I now only put male names at the top of my proposals and I moved into building a clean tech business. I voted with my feet and I went into business thinking that this would be a, a, a better opportunity. But a few years later, I found that only 1% of equity investments go to female led businesses. And I was stunned and I, I hope everyone here is stunned also. So my request today is clear. Science funding in international programs must be 50-50 female and male. Science doesn't have a gender, but clearly science and technology funding today does. That skews technical, economic, geopolitical and global governance in a breathtaking clean power grab by male scientists. This is not a good strategy for any one of us. So my ask is clear today, international programs should have a 50% female funding target. Uh, to demonstrate and to orchestrate real commitment to, to genuine environmental and social governance, ESG, and corporate and social responsibility, CSR, um, compliance. 
really, I think we must include gender equality in both of those definitions. In terms of policy, there must be robust definitions. And really, we cannot say that an investment is ESG or CSR compliant if it only 1% of the resources is going to 50% of the population. We know the benefits of mixed gender teams. We know that women are 50% of the market. We know diversity of thought stimulates innovation. Leadership in COVID, women leaders performed well. Mixed gender boards make more money. They pay themselves less. So everyone must reflect on increasing equality to improve innovation. And I really believe that this step supports the entire next generation, not just half of the next generation. We must all get comfortable with supporting 50-50. And the next generation will ask you and I about fairness. And we have to now engage with the tidal wave of, of women scientists that are coming into this field. Thank you so much. Taylor, and some very powerful, thank you very much, some very powerful messages and points there and some very, very revealing statistics. And indeed, I think you underline an extremely important dimension of the challenge that we face. I mean, our commissioner, Maria Gabriel, responsible for uh, research and innovation has been uh, strongly supporting the efforts we're making at a European level, as you know, uh, to uh, build uh, uh, diversity, equal opportunity uh, and gender uh, into the way that we manage the European research programs. But it's a global challenge, I know, and, and your experiences in other parts of the world, I think, are also um, uh, very relevant. So thank you for, for sharing that with us uh, um, today. Um, if I may now move on to our next speaker. Uh, so uh, Christian Orion um, is the founder of Endurance Electric, um, a social company that seeks to alleviate energy poverty for vulnerable fam families in Chile and Latin America. And he was the uh, 2020 Mission Innovation Champion uh, for Chile. And so Christian, my question for you is about your work on innovative technology adoption metal, me models for decentralized solar energy, which we see as playing an important role in the fight against energy poverty in rural communities. And I guess what we'd like to hear is what your advice to governments would be um, about how best to facilitate your and other social entrepreneurs working through clean energy innovation policies. And what are the barriers that, that they can help you as governments to overcome in order to make your uh, work have an even more powerful impact? So, Christian, over to you, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be here. Uh, I think social entrepreneurship is a very important part in order to fight a, against energy poverty and supporting these kind of ventures and entrepreneurs behind and their teams is a key role. Um, I believe there is a user-centered design methodology behind the work of these organizations because we are on the field most of the time and that leads to a lot of on the field knowledge that these entrepreneurs are capturing from families uh, that I'm sure are pretty useful, useful for other organizations especially governments in order to uh, design policies. Rural communities are often very hard to reach and involve more time and resources. The market is often not well developed if there's any market at all. So maybe this is the kind of support that social venture needs at early stage, uh, like programs that they help to form a new market but focusing on the user. I mean, for example, if there's going to be a financial aid or financial help for families, let's give them to the final users who will be able to choose from different suppliers rather than the company itself. Also, putting the energy concept into the national agenda, I think is super important because since most of the population don't really know what is this, that this problem really exists, at least I'm talking at a local uh, national level uh, here in Chile. Uh, so most of the people assume that is, this problem is already solved which is not, especially in rural areas. Um, I believe that creating or leading instances for collaboration and communication that involves all the parts, including the final user, uh, the people that is going to be impacted, but also different organizations, not only government, but also social, uh, local organizations, so, uh, private entrepreneurs, I think it's a factor that will really help to move faster and strong in order to fight this problem. 
Uh, direct support with resources like financial support, knowledge, and networks will also help social entrepreneurs to deploy more pilot programs that often are very risky for our organizations, but could be super important and impactful for people in a later stage if those pilots turn to be successful. We could and we should face this risk together because it's a national problem. There's also an important need to talk and speak at a more like, I would say, like an informal level, uh, communicating to normal people at our houses. I mean, solar energy is something that people already know something about it. We look at the, uh, the solar panels in the house, we look at the television, um, we read it in the news, but it's often, it, in my opinion, it seems like a very big like industrial economic news. So why not share stories from local normal people at the household level? We need more and deeper stories from people that is using solar and renewable energy. From entrepreneurs also and local organizations that are doing something about this. Uh, if we are able to do this more, I believe that we will be able to close the gap of energy poverty for thousands of families. These families, remember, are also facing climate change effects in a faster and bigger way. Thus, renewable energy, especially solar energy, knowledge at the household level is key to a real adoption of this technology for the people in the country. Thank you very much. Christian, uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing with us your uh, experience of that uh, you know, rather different dimension, but nevertheless very, very important of how uh, you know sometimes we forget that the, uh, the pace and scale of the energy transition that we are contemplating with our efforts to meet the uh, Paris objectives are going to have profound social and economic consequences. And so the work that you're doing, uh, particularly in, in the communities that you're, you're working with in, in, in with poverty and, and rural areas uh, is so vitally important and, and your experience is very valuable. So look, um, I think we've heard now from the um, uh, from the uh, four um, uh, champions uh, from the Mission Innovation Program that that uh, we were looking forward to. Um, and I'd like to now to move on to a little bit more the industry perspective, and we're really lucky to have with us um, uh, Maurizio Becciceri. Um, so he is head of the Latin America region of NL, one of the largest global energy companies, of course. Um, and uh, Maurizio has spent uh, uh, his man professional career, including several management positions in, in Europe, in the in Americas and in the Middle East, uh, working for different uh, energy and mining companies, and so I think uh, uh, really well placed to share with us the perspective of um, uh, of industry in this important dynamic. And so I, my question, Maritza, would uh, perhaps to kick off your remarks would be you know, really just looking at uh, the discussion from the perspective of a global industrial player like NL. Um, and, and the company, of course, which has put forward an ambitious low carbon investment plan. Um, what role do you see for research, development and innovation in achieving uh, the ambitious decarbonization targets that we've all set? And how can governments enable industry to maximize the uptake of innovative technologies? And what do you see as the place of the sort of uh, success stories uh, that we have heard from the um, successful innovators on our Champions Program in contributing to the broader work of a big company like yours? Thank you, Patrick. Uh, let's, say, let's start saying that uh, sustainability is uh, the core of any uh, strategy, and uh, this strategy is aligned with the uh, sustainable development goal of the United Nations and uh, the Paris uh, Agreement uh, uh, target. Uh, this strategy um, allows us today to have something like uh, 46,000 megawatt of renewable energy and uh, serve uh, 75 million of end users with our, uh, with our grids. Of course, what's the uh, target uh, of these uh, uh, innovative technologies uh, and uh, clean technologies is just to maximize the positive impact for our uh, customer, uh, worker, and more in general, 
the wider community that are around uh, our uh, our uh, plant. Uh, of course, this kind of approach needs a, a multi-layer uh, uh, approach. And we do usually, we boost uh, innovation, we push for circular uh, economy, we, of course, take care of cyber security, uh, you, we have digitalization of our uh, process and uh, product, and of course, we move for uh, sustainable uh, uh, finance. Regarding uh, innovation, we have a, a specific approach. We have an open innovability model, it's a, a common platform that allows our, um, our uh, company, our business line, our function, to uh, enter in contact with startup, industrial uh, partners, small and medium enterprise, research center, and uh, university. What we have uh, spread all over the world as well is innovation hub that are a sort of catalyzer for uh, startups in the different country where uh, we operate. What the result of this, uh, this uh, open uh, platform is that we have right now in operation uh, more or less 800 uh, partnership at, uh, group, uh, at group level to address new challenge and opportunities. The, the majority, many of them are focused on boosting uh, digital services to our uh, uh, client for energy efficiencies and management. The second part of your question regarding government, Enel, of course, we are we believe strongly believe in uh, uh, public-private uh, partnership and uh, uh, open uh, uh, cooperation with all stakeholders just to speed up the energy transition and uh, uh, work for a sustainable uh, transformation of the society. In this respect, uh, the role of governments and uh, other stakeholders is fundamental. For this purpose, we have built up uh, another uh, open platform uh, that works on uh, energy transition uh, roadmaps. What is the target of this uh, uh, platform? It's just uh, to define the right mix of policies for a just energy transition. And uh, in this platform works governmental institutions, ONG companies, uh, uh, and many other players, stakeholders that can add, has some, uh, some, uh, some insight uh, and vision uh, for the future. As well, in this, uh, in this work of energy, uh, sustainable uh, uh, energy uh, transition roadmaps, uh, we work at different type of level. Education and training with the Enel Foundation, research and innovation with the open innovability uh, platform, as I said before. Industrial operation, we use a stewardship model, uh, we push for circular uh, economy as well. Suppliers and customer, we di have digitalized platform for a, a, a scalable approach worldwide. And financial investor. That means sustainable finance and SDG linked, uh, linked bonds. Energy transition, of course, needs the, a common ground uh, with the local governments. And we have several uh, examples of this kind of innovation. We have electric mobility in Chile and Colombia, renewable energy in Chile, Colombia, Brazil and Peru. Uh, futurability in, Bra in Brazil, that means uh, uh, smart lighting and uh, circular and smart city, electrification in Peru, green hydrogen in Chile. And like in Europe, uh, I think that Latin America needs to take uh, the example of uh, uh, Europe, in which, as you know better than me, uh, the majority of green recovery of the recovery of the, uh, the economy is based on green, on green solution. Finally, I think that the key roles of uh, government uh, uh, is uh, uh, mostly related in the definition, redefinition of uh, policy and regulatory frameworks that can help uh, innovation just to spread up 
uh, uh, all over uh, the, uh, the sector. And finally, uh, you asked me what can be the role of, uh, of this innovation. Uh, I think it can be fundamental in, uh, in, uh, in the way in which we can work as a grid, as a network, because nobody can do uh, everything alone. So we need just a strong cooperation, uh, bringing uh, the real uh, the, the solution to the real needs of uh, population. Thanks. Well, Maurizio, thank you very much uh, for sharing with us uh, your very uh, diverse and comprehensive uh, experiences, but also your valuable and I think inspiring perspective from the uh, uh, the work of uh, NL and other large industrial uh, actors in this field. So, so thank you very much for being with us. Uh, we now move to the final section of our uh, discussion our roundtable today where we're going to have a sort of um, uh, fireside exchange between two um, uh, key, key uh, uh, interlocutors, um, uh, Meredith Adler from Student Energy and Maria Luisa Hernandez La Torre, uh, who is the um, co-founder and CEO of Ingelia, a company based in Spain, um, uh, leading an industrial initiative to recover carbon and other elements from organic waste and, and bio, to produce biomaterials. And Maria Luisa is the champion for the European Commission uh, on behalf of the EU. Uh, and Meredith Adler, who is going to be uh, uh, interacting with her, is uh, the executive director of Student Energy, who therefore oversees the um, uh, strategy and operations of the Student Energy Organization uh, and is, is working to build a movement of students and young people across the world uh, committed to a sustainable energy future. Um, so uh, I'd like to start just by, uh, you know, proposing a question for uh, Meredith. Um, today, many young innovat innovators are facing challenges of getting resources and networks necessary to get their ideas deployed. What do you think governments should do more uh, to help young innovators in particular to bridge br br these gaps? Yeah, I think that governments, first of all, need to acknowledge that currently getting into the innovation ecosystem requires a level of power and privilege that really isn't accessible to most young people. And so it's creating a really large missed opportunity because many young people are perfectly positioned within their communities to be these real accelerators of deployment of innovation. And so the main thing governments need to think about doing is building programs outside of universities that really allow for development of deployment skills through coaching and mentorship opportunities, but also to really address the funding gap for young innovators. Young innovators, it takes them between five to 10 years often to get their first piece of funding. And that's really an unnecessary level of lead time um, and really leaving behind a lot of innovation, a lot of ability to deploy. And I think particularly speaking to the aspect of women in innovation um, or people who lack the privilege to, um, to be self-funded while they wait for that level of funding, um, you know, our current network at Student Energy is about 50% women with 50,000 young people in 120 different countries. And we know that today, um, that's not the statistics when you look at the innovation landscape. And so I think governments can do a big part in, in helping to close that gap by really thinking about how to directly get funding to young people and then how to really expand the skill building opportunities outside of just the university ecosystem. Great. Thanks. I think now you're you're going to um, interact with uh, Maria Luisa. Um, yes, so Maria Luisa, I also have a few questions for you. Um, so as I just mentioned, you know, funding is often at the center of conversations and innovation. What has been your experience with the investment community, and how have government research and development programs been helpful? And then, do you feel like they were really successfully working together with your work in different innovations? Well, thank you, Meredith, and thank you very much, Mission Innovation, as well, for, for your support. Um, we have developed a new industrial development from scratch, and since the beginning, uh, we closed five increased capital rounds, having attracted capital for 3.5 million euros and debt for 4 million euros. And we invested all in technology and products development. Uh, besides to this, we have also sold 6 million euros in, in plants for clients. So that we have currently a balance sheet of around 12 million and are working on Series B investment to finance companies, growth and international deployment. So we could say, uh, or we can say our experience with the investment community has been successful. However, and despite of the good company's uh, finance structure, because we have 50% is capital and 50% is debt, not always it has been easy to get financing. 
And I think because innovative projects should have specific evaluation tools from the financing perspective in terms of risk measurement and grow opportunities. <clears throat> Uh, one important, important thing to be considered in, in industrial innovation is that CAPEX is much higher compared to developments at lab scale. And therefore, the risk perceived by the investors is higher as well. And that makes industrial innovation really difficult to finance. In my opinion, it is key to align investors' interests with companies' objectives since the very beginning, and not only in terms of money, but also in terms of total value. We looked for investors that could contribute with additional value to the company's development based on their previous experience and knowledge in business creation and involving them at the board of directors. Um, being able to couple private and public funding is key. On one hand, the capital that the company gets is increased. And on the other hand, investors get additional confidence since the project needs to successfully pass a diligence made made by a high level group of experts from the public institutions in order to be selected for funding. I think it is also very important to acknowledge the different phases of the project development and attract the key stakeholders from the industry, science, financing and markets. The investors want to see capacity to sell. They want good company expectations and ambitious business plan. And in order to do that, the company needs to work in sales capital raising and technology development at the same time without or with very low access to finance yet. And this phase can take longer than expected. So here is where public funding plays a very important role. Programs of financing the go-to-market strategy are key for the innovators, including, for example, um, financing of working capital, project financing, warranties to cover the first years of plant operations or funding for demonstrations plants. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And I think the other clear challenge for innovation often is regulation. So what what obstacles have you faced in trying to implement new innovations, especially if regulators haven't yet considered it? And how can governments ease the burden of deploying innovation? Well, indeed, uh, regulations are very important. And I would recommend to start in as soon as possible working on them uh, in order to shorten the time to market. Uh, regulations usually come after product development, and therefore they need to be implemented quickly in order to facilitate market penetration of new technologies. Environmental certifications, uh, working on committees for standardizations of new products, project permitting, etc., suppose an intensive work for the innovators. And besides to these, people working in the public administration are often are not experts in new technologies. So on one hand, they need more time for the evaluation of the, of the technologies. And on the other hand, the company could be working on the same permitting process in different places as well. And I think, for example, that arranging a group of experts at national level around every key innovative technology that could provide support to public administrations on the evaluation and that could take part in the technical committees for standardization of new products, this could be a, so a good solution. The companies will need to follow up in any case and support these activities, but at the end, this would extremely help companies to accelerate their market entrance, I think. I think that's a fantastic point. Well, thank you so much for sharing um, both of those pieces with me. I think it's inspiring to see innovators like you um, in the mission innovation ecosystem. Thank you very much. To thank you very much, um, uh, Marie Louisa and, and Meredith, for that for that exchange. And I think you've uh, really uh, uh, had a, an excellent sort of closing sort of contribution to what's been for me an extremely rich and and uh, uh, an, an interesting uh, discussion, uh, drawing on the real sort of strength of experience and the stories from our innovators uh, uh, from the Champions Program um, uh, and, and how that fits into the work we're doing as governments. So I'd like to conclude by thanking everyone for your uh, for your inputs. Thanks to all the speakers. Uh, thanks to our Chilean hosts for uh, in, in, in organizing this event and for including it in the in the program of the Mission Innovation and Clean uh, Energy Ministerial Summit. Um, uh, and I think that taking forward this conversation is going to be very important in the future. 
I think what we've heard today is a number of very important themes. Firstly, uh, the importance of partnership, of having govern governments and the innovation community working together. Secondly, the importance of getting the regulatory framework right and ensuring that policymakers understand the context in which um, our innovation communities are, are striving to succeed. And a big part of uh, their ability to make progress is, of course, financing. And that's the uh, third thing that I'd like to mention, which has come up uh, repeatedly. Uh, financing to support all phases of the um, innovation uh, and commercial deployment uh, journey uh, from the earliest research uh, through to uh, scaling up and, and commercial exploitation. Um, we've heard the importance of equal access to uh, uh, research and funding opportunities uh, with particular emphasis on gender equality. And I think that that is a theme which we should certainly uh, focus on very strongly in our future work and in this area. Um, we've heard about the necessary attention, um, not just to technological development, but also to ensuring that there is socio-economic acceptance um, and, and a good environment in which our new technologies are being um, uh, developed. And I think that the work uh, uh, in particular of bringing clean, affordable energy solutions to rural communities um, is vitally important in, in that context. And we've had many other ideas as well in, in what has been, I think, a wide ranging uh, and very productive discussion. And so on behalf of the Mission Innovation Community, on behalf of the steering committee, of which I'm, I'm proud to be the chair, and on behalf of all the ministers um, who've been working together uh, to forge a path for clean energy innovation over the last days. Um, I want to thank all of you for your participation, everybody who has listened to this uh, um, event, and I hope that it has inspired us all uh, with some really exciting new ideas and opportunities uh, which we can take forward uh, as we work on the clean energy innovation journey uh, from now, I hope, to the COP26 meeting, which we will uh, have later in the year, which I think will be a landmark event, uh, which will define in many ways the future and of uh, our capacity to address climate change and the vitally important contribution of clean energy innovation uh, in that context. So thank you all very much for uh, joining us today. Thanks to the organizers of this session, which have technically, I think, worked very smoothly. Um, and I wish you all an excellent day. Thank you.